Hi, I'm Joseph Feraldi. I want to thank you for joining us here at Bayside Chapel online. Our prayer is that today's service will be a blessing to you, that will encourage you in your journey with Jesus Christ, and it will help you to see all that God has in store for you. We would love to hear from you on how God is using this ministry to bless you, and we'd love the opportunity to pray for you. Just send us an email at amen at baysidechapel.org. Remember that you can stay in touch with us at any time. Just visit the App Store and search for our app at Bayside Chapel of NJ. Also, if God is using this ministry to bless you, we'd like to give you the opportunity to partner with us financially. Simply go online to BaysideChapel.org or use the Bayside Chapel app and choose whatever option works best for you. Enjoy today's message. I told you before a few years ago about a story about an Irish Protestant teacher that was testing her children in Sunday school, wanting to make sure they understood that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ and not as a matter of our good works. And so she was quizzing them about how one could get into heaven. And she said to them, if I was kind to animals and gave candy to all the children and loved my husband, would that get me into heaven? And the children responded with the resounding, no! Well, she thought, okay, maybe they're really getting it. So she tried another angle. She said, if I clean the church every day, cut the grass, and kept everything tidy, would that get me into heaven? And the children responded, no. Well, she was uh, starting to smile, thinking that, you know, the kids were really getting it. So she tried one more time. Well, then if I sold my house and my car, had a big rummage sale, and gave all my money to the church, would that get me into heaven? The children responded once again, no. So thinking that she had this nailed, she said, okay, children, what would I, how would I get into heaven? And five-year-old Sean responded, you'd have to be dead. <laughs> we have engaged uh, for the last few weeks in a financial stewardship campaign that we're calling Bayside 3.0. And no, we haven't been promising that you can get into heaven by giving all your money to the church. And there may very well be some people who'd rather be dead than give their money to this project. Uh, but once again, let me put you at ease. Uh, no, we're not becoming a church that's asking for money all the time. It's been several years since we've had a campaign like this, and it's not likely to be, uh, we're not likely to have one for several more years to come, but growing churches where God is at work need to stretch financially from time to time. If someone doesn't want to be bothered with a campaign like this, then I suppose they could go to a church that isn't doing anything. But where there is a vision to reach more people with the gospel, God's people will inevitably be encouraged from time to time to give generously of their time and talents and treasures to accomplish that vision. Now, rather than begging, cajoling, manipulating, or arm twisting, we've decided to take a very different approach to this project. We've decided to inform you of the need and ask you to pray. And so for the last three weeks, we've asked you to be in prayer about Bayside 3.0 and ask the Lord what part he might have you to play in helping us with this project. Six years ago, the members of Bayside voted overwhelmingly to adopt a vision statement that included, among other things, the idea that we would take responsibility for planting a network of thriving churches with Bayside's DNA up and down the Garden State Parkway corridor. That's a big vision. Uh, two and a half years ago, we launched Wellspring Church in Toms River with about 80 of our people and a financial commitment of $220,000. And today, any given weekend, there could be 400 people worshiping there at Wellspring. Uh, Jason told me that, uh, like in the last month, they've baptized about 40 people. God is doing great things there. <laughs> Wellspring is making an impact for Christ in Tom's River, perhaps like no other church in that city right now. And I think you can see how, how God has returned our investment. And now true to our vision, we believe that God is leading us to do it again in Lakehurst this time under the leadership of Nick Dalio, as you heard last week. Why Lakehurst? Well, we've had experience there. In 2018, we had the opportunity of coming alongside of uh, a struggling church, Ocean County Evangelical Free Church, to see what we could do to help them out. 
But when they decided as a congregation to close their doors at the end of last year, the denomination put the building up for sale and offered us very favorable terms. And so we have an opportunity in Lakehurst that kind of the Lord has dropped in our laps, if you will. Lakehurst is a community slated for significant growth and doesn't have a church quite like Bayside, which is why we have a significant number of people who drive down from Whiting, Manchester area to come to church here every Sunday. We're envisioning a church that will appeal to the the new retirees moving into the 55 and up communities up there, but also to the many families connected to the military base, uh, the military families connected to the joint base. And to that end, we have encouraged Those of you, especially those of you who live up that way, to consider becoming a part of the Proving Ground launch team. You met the core team last week, but we're going to be gathering a a launch team of 80 or 100 people from Bayside that we want to be part of that effort in Lakehurst. Now, three weeks ago, we talked about the need for generosity as we prepare to do renovations uh, and upgrades here in our own auditorium and prepare to launch Proving Ground Church next fall. Our goal, as we have told you, is to raise $660,000 over the next three years in addition to our annual budget. $300,000 is to renovate and prepare Proving Ground uh, to get ready for launch next September. $300,000 to replace our aging sound system that I hope works through the end of the service. Um, and then to beautify this room uh, because we realize that uh, this is going to be the place where we're going to be worshiping for the foreseen future, uh, to, uh, to replace the flooring, to redo the stage and beautify it, to, to redecorate with a different color scheme, $300,000 so that we make this room a room that feels like a dedicated worship space where we happen to do other ministry during the week instead of feeling so much like a gym where we happen to worship one day a week. $60,000 will be a tithe for global missions projects around the world. That's a, a precedent that we've established in the last two campaigns and that we've seen the, the Lord use in amazing ways around the world. And anything that comes in above that $660,000 will help to retire some of our mortgage debt. So today we're asking you to make a commitment to Bayside 3.0. And that's why we're looking at First Chronicles 29 as another example of how God's people are sometimes asked to participate financially in his work. Now, a few weeks ago, we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul was encouraging the church of Corinth to finish collecting an offering for the benefit of struggling believers in Jerusalem and to be generous about it. We learned from that passage what it means to be generous, and and we learned from that passage how God rewards generosity. This week and next, we'll look at another example of God's people giving their resources to accomplish an important work. In this case, it's the building of the first temple in Jerusalem. And and from this example, we're going to learn some important lessons about how we should go about investing in the Lord's work. The main character in this passage is King David, the second king of Israel and Israel's greatest king, Uh, Israel's warrior king who accomplished uh, much during his reign of 40 years. He he subdued and conquered the surrounding nations. He established a a capital city in Jerusalem. He built a, a luxurious palace for himself and he had it in his heart to build a temple for the Lord because uh, the Lord was still being worshipped at the tabernacle, the tent that they had, they had taken through the wilderness wanderings, and it was a, a temporary dwelling, and uh, David thought it was only proper that the Lord have a permanent uh, temple uh, in Jerusalem, but the Lord said no. Uh, David wouldn't be the one to build that, because as a man of war, he had blood on his hands, and he wanted his son Solomon instead, a man of peace, to build the temple for him, And so David, as he nears the end of his life, makes it the rest of his life's project to prepare Solomon for the task of building the temple because Solomon is young and inexperienced. So David goes about drawing up plans for the temple according to the instructions that God had given. He leads a financial stewardship campaign to gather all the materials that will be needed. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, he opens the royal treasury. Now, that's where all the booty from battle would have been collected from the surrounding nations. Uh, and, and out of the royal treasury, he gives toward the project gold and silver and iron and bronze. But David feels that it's not right that this 
temple for the Lord be built solely with public funds, if you will, he needs to have a stake in building the house of the Lord and the people need to have a stake in it too. They need to have some skin in the game. So David makes this appeal beginning at verse one of chapter 29 where it says, and David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon my son whom alone God has chosen is young and inexperienced and the work is great for the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God, so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx and stones for setting, antimony, colored stones, all sorts of precious stones and marble. David is referring here to the the. The, the, the wealth that has been given out of the royal treasury for this project. It tells us in chapter 22 that that amounted to 40 tons of gold, 40,000 tons of silver, quantities of iron, bronze, and wood too great to be weighed. So David has already given out of the royal treasury a vast amount of wealth for building the temple. But then he does something rather extraordinary. He makes an additional commitment out of his personal assets, And so it says in verse three, moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own, gold and silver, and because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give it to the house of my God, 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir. Now this is 110 tons of the finest quality gold, worth today over $66 million dollars. And he says, I'm giving 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house and for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver. So in addition to all the gold he gives, he gives 700 and, or 260 tons of silver, which would be worth about 9.8 million today. So just between the gold and silver, about $76 million worth that comes out of David's own personal wealth. And here I think we see the first lesson about how God's people should go about giving to the Lord's work like this. And that is that leaders should set an example of generosity. Leaders should set an example of generosity. When a leader asks people to make a commitment, it's only fair to expect that he has made a significant commitment himself. David, as the leader of Israel, goes first in stating that he has plans to personally contribute to building the temple. Now I've asked you to pray for these last three weeks what God would have you give to Bayside 3.0. And Diane and I have been praying too. It's only fair that you know what we believe God is leading us to do. First, I I want you to understand that we're committed to tithing. That's just our, our commitment, our conviction that we should tithe to our local church and so one tenth of our income regularly goes to Bayside Chapel. Uh, I want you to know that what we're committing to Bayside 3.0 is over and above our tithe because it doesn't help for people merely to shift their giving from their normal giving to Bayside 3.0. That just leaves the general fund short. And so these need to be over and above gifts. Over the years, God has laid it on our hearts to give beyond our tithe to support missionaries, friends and family members who have different ministries and serve as missionaries in different parts of the world. He's led us to sponsor children through Compassion International and all of that amounts to an additional 5% of our income. So when we considered what more we could give to Bayside 3.0, we knew it'd have to be a step of faith because that other 85% of the budget is pretty much spoken for, for bills and whatnot. So we don't know exactly where it's going to come from, uh, whether through unexpected income that sometimes comes our way, or maybe it'll be part of a tax return, or two or three, or, or, or by cutting corners here or there, we'll come up with some extra cash, but the commitment we're making today amounts to an additional 2% of our income, so that That means for the next three years, we're committing 17% of our combined income to the Lord's work. Now, I offer this information not in a spirit of bragging. I don't want you to hear it that way. But I offer it in the spirit that David does here in 1 Chronicles 29. I want you to know we're taking Bayside 3.0 seriously. 
We've got skin in the game. And I want you to know that I'm not asking you to make sacrifices that we're not willing to make. Now, Nick and Tracy Dalio also have skin in the game. Uh, they are committed to tithing, to Bayside and Proving Ground, ultimately, when they make the switch to Proving Ground. In addition, they say we will contribute the three, to the 3.0 campaign on a monthly basis uh, in which the total monthly pledge is what we pledge combined to the last two Bayside campaigns. So they're, they're making a substantial monthly commitment. And then they say we will evaluate every tax season and hope to give an additional once a year gift to the 3.0 campaign every tax season over and above our monthly commitments for the next three years. Nick and Tracy have skin in the game. Leaders should set an example of generosity. That's what David does here. He takes the lead by telling the people, here's the commitment that I'm making. Now, having told everyone what he's giving, you'd expect David to say next, okay, now what are you giving? But that's not what he says. He actually says something quite different at the end of verse five. He says, who then will offer willingly consecrating himself to the Lord today? The word consecrating is a rather unusual word. You wouldn't expect it here. Consecration is what you went through to become a priest in ancient Israel. It meant being set apart wholly for the Lord. David is saying to the people of Israel, before you give anything else, give yourselves to the Lord. David is asking them to offer themselves to God. When people commit themselves to whatever God wants to do, when people consecrate themselves to the Lord, then there will be no lack of resources to get the job done. And so David says, now who is willing to consecrate himself today to the Lord? Here's the second important lesson. When God's people give to an important work like this, the first lesson is that the leaders should set an example of generosity. The leader needs to go first, but then... Leaders must challenge God's people to make a commitment. Leaders must challenge God's people to make a commitment. A leader must not shrink from calling on God's people to be fully committed to him. If I don't do that on a regular basis, I'm failing to do my duty as your pastor. And so I urge us, again, anyone who considers Bayside his or her church home, including those of you who are planning to go to Proving Ground Church, give yourself afresh to God and his purposes for your life and for the advancement of the gospel. Let's stand as one before God today and say, here we are, Lord, use us. Use us to boldly bear witness of the saving power of Christ. Use us to become a people who are growing in the word and being made new by your spirit. Use us to be a people so transformed by Jesus Christ that he will send us to transform communities in his name. Use us to bring women and men and girls and boys to faith in Christ. Use us to bring hope to people with hurts and habits and hang-ups. Use us to take the gospel to people who need Jesus in Lakehurst. Use us to be a force to advance the cause of the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so I'm asking, will you consecrate yourself to the Lord today? It's through consecrated people that God most powerfully works. And look what happens in verse six. It says, then the leaders of the father's houses made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and the officers over the king's work. These were free will offerings. In addition to the tithes and offerings they were required by law to give, they were free will offerings in that they were given willingly as evidence that they had given themselves first to the Lord. No one was required to give. These gifts were prompted by willing hearts. And that's what we're looking for today. We're looking for people to give to Bayside 3.0 with willing hearts in the belief that everyone can do something. Do you realize how attainable this goal of $660,000 over three years really is? Consider that our average Sunday attendance is about 900 people or more. It's more than that, but let's just round it off to 900. If 900 people gave just 67 cents a day for three years, we would easily exceed our goal. 67 cents a day. Do you think we have 67 cents a day that each of us could give to see people reach for Christ in in Lakehurst and, and to accomplish the other things that we're trying to accomplish with this project. Now, 
some may not be able to give 67 cents a day. We're not talking here about equal gifts, but equal sacrifice. Uh, Some may not be able to give 67 cents a day. Others are capable of doing far more than that and ought to do so. But everyone can do something. But don't bother to give anything at all if it doesn't come from a willing heart. The people in verse 6, it says, gave willingly. They gave in the spirit of, of what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 9. Each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. And that's the spirit in which these gifts are being offered in 1 Chronicles 29 by people who are consecrated to the Lord, who are excited to have a part in the great work that was being done for God there in Jerusalem. And so it says in verse 7, they gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold. 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, 100,000 talents of iron, and whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in the care of Jehiel the Gershonite. This amounts to 190 tons of gold worth $114 million in today's dollars. 375 tons of silver worth about $14 million. 675 tons of bronze 3,750 tons of iron. The total offering that day from the people was over $130 million by today's standards. It's amazing what happens when God's people start considering what they should give. You know, my part doesn't seem like all that much, but when you start putting all of our offerings together, it really adds up. And I wonder if the folks mentioned in these verses went through some of the same kind of decision process that many of us have been going through, where the initial reaction is, oh, I don't have anything more to give, but okay, I'll pray. I'll pray and ask God to show me. And God shows me uh, some money here in my budget that I, I could reallocate. Or maybe, you know, I anticipate getting a tax refund. I could give part of that. I could do some side jobs and maybe bring in a little extra income and and contribute that. I once had somebody say that they they tracked their expenses on Quicken and and they were tithers. They gave a tenth of their income to the Lord's work, but as they tracked their their expenses on on Quicken, they found that they they were spending at least the same amount as their tithe, eating out. And they said, you know what, we, we decided that we could easily eat in more often and contribute the difference to this project. How about bring your own coffee a few times a week instead of stopping at Starbucks or, or pack your own lunch instead of buying it every day? I had a, another friend I knew who, who earmarked certain investments. He was an investor and he would buy stock and he would say, you know, whatever profit this stock makes over the next year, I'm going to give half of that to the Lord's work. Well, he happened to buy Apple stock early, and it did well. And, and he, he contributed generous amounts to the project that we were working on at the time. I imagine that those people who gave to build the temple went through much the same kind of discernment process, but they went through it with the spirit of, you know, it's not a question of do I have to give or, okay, how much do you want from me now or... I don't know if we can really afford it. Now they give more with the spirit of, wow, look what we get to do. We get to help build the temple of the Lord. It's a privilege to be part of something this big, something this important. Now for some of you, you've already given to four different projects like this in the history of Bayside. Some of you have been part of Bayside for a long time. You maybe have given to the initial project that bought this land and, and, and raised this building. Uh, or you may have given to the two different uh, fundraising projects that helped to finally complete the West Wing, or maybe you gave to the Next Step Fund that led to the planting of Wellspring Church. Some of you have already given four times, or two times, or one time, or three times, depending on how long you've been part of Bayside. For all of you who have given to previous projects, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to participate in those things. We've seen God do great things as his people here have made commitments to give generously to these projects. And you've had the joy of knowing that you've had a part in that through your generosity. 
And in days to come, when God begins to use Proving Ground Church to reach people for Jesus in Lakehurst, or when we get reports from our missionaries around the world about what they've accomplished with Bayside 3.0 funds, we'll have the joy of knowing that what we gave is bearing eternal fruit, that lives are being changed forever. When we let God direct us, it's exciting and encouraging to see what happens. Look at how this passage ends in verse nine. It says, then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly. For with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. We see here the joy of commitment to the Lord and to his work. And so, yes, leaders should set an example of generosity. Leaders need to go first. Leaders must challenge God's people to make a commitment. But then here's the third lesson of this passage, and that is that gifts must be given wholeheartedly to the Lord. It was apparent that those who gave that day gave freely and not under compulsion. It was their decision freely made to give as they did. These were not reluctant gifts. They were given wholeheartedly, not to King David and not to a building project, but these were gifts given to the Lord. So I would encourage you as you consider making a commitment to Bayside 3.0, don't give to impress me because I'll actually not know what you're committing. All, all the commitments are confidential. The only person who will know the commitments is our bookkeeper who will tally them. And then she'll keep a record of who committed what. So don't give to impress me because I won't know who gives what. And don't just give to a project. Whatever you give, give it wholeheartedly to the Lord, because there is no higher motivation in giving, is there, than to honor the one who gave his life for us, Amen. who suffered and died on the cross for our sins and paid the ransom that sets us free and rose from the dead so that we could have new life with God. He's given us the greatest gift that could ever be given, and what we give is only a reflection of that. So whatever you decide to give today, give it wholeheartedly to the Lord. And when offerings are given this way, it's a beautiful thing. Here in verse nine, when, when uh, they, they gave their offerings, God's people rejoiced and the king rejoiced. And in the verses that follow that we're gonna look at next week, an amazing time of worship breaks out. Today is the call for commitment. Next week, we're going to report on what commitments have been made. It's going to be a day for giving thanks. You don't wanna miss that, so be sure to be here. But today we're going to end the service by collecting your commitment cards and singing a song of commitment, asking the Lord to do it again.